We really hope you're going to enjoy this film, which is about how and why innovation came about in climbing hardway, hardware as a result of the demands of uh, gritstone climbing in the Peak District and the way in which the protection which it afforded affected overall British climbing standards for many years following. In the so-called golden age of alpine mountaineering in the mid-19th century, British dominated as first ascensionists. The expertise for making climbing gear, however, resided in the Alps, with the earliest mountain hardware companies being blacksmiths. This included companies like Seamond and Gravel, which were both established in the early 19th century to make local mountain communities, agricultural and other equipment. And they diversified into specialist mountain hardware as mountaineering took off in the Alps in the 1860s. Expertise also came from the growing number of mountain guides whose skill lay behind the successful ascents. It was they, not generally the British climbers, who understood what was needed and what was possible in technical mountain gear. The growth of technical climbing, first in Saxony and then in the limestone regions in the Eastern Alps, created new climbing needs for artificial aids, including pitons and carabiners in the late 19th century. The use of these aids were largely rejected by the British, who believed they broke the rules of the climbing game. Little technical gear from rucksacks to climbing hardware was made in Britain before 1960. Until the First World War, mountain climbing in the UK had been the preserve of a wealthy, public school educated social elite. But during the 1920s and 1930s, there was growing enthusiasm for outdoor activities among lower middle and working class people living in industrial conurbations, especially in Manchester and in Sheffield. Easy train travel and unemployment during the Great Depression swelled the numbers walking and climbing in the Peak District Gritstone. Leading edge climbers often became lead user innovators. They used what was at hand and adapted for their own purposes. They would weigh up what's needed to solve a climbing problem and what was possible given materials and skills as we see Don Willans doing with the box tent. Working class lead user innovators in the Peak District identified new climbing and equipment needs. They were socially and geographically separate from the established climbing elite, and so they did not know what they were not supposed to do. The rock and conditions were different from North Wales and the lakes where the elite climbed, and this led them to develop protective gear which significantly raised standards. John Brailsford is, is just such a lead user innovator, an orphan from Sheffield. He was introduced to the outdoors by the scouts and threw outward bound and was apprenticed to a Sheffield steel company. His experience of the craftsmanship of steel making has stayed with him for life. Chalk stones were already being used for protection in the 1940s. We'll show you next how John Brailsford's manufactured nut took protection to a whole new level. Nuts were an alternative to the piton and didn't damage the rock. The origin was simple and came from the practice of using small rocks to jam the rope to avoid untying and retying on climbs. Many climbers worked in engineering works and collected nuts from work and even the Snowdon Mountain Railway. Exactly who originated the machining of engineering nuts into climbing nuts is unclear, but the first manufactured nut was made by John Brailsford. The nut raised climbing standards in Britain, as previously standards had been constrained by lack of protection. Here, John Brailsford tells Mike Parsons the story of the acorn and the moak, the first manufactured nut. Because partly we were data climbing in the quarries, and there weren't as many natural threats, because it was rock that had been worked what were there were were the cracks such as Limpopo Groove and Great Harry. They had these little keyhole shaped holes in them. So if you got something to drop in the keyhole, you could easily get it out again, that is the same could get it out again. And uh, if you got two or three of these things in then you were bomb proof. And they were much better and much less fiddly than like placing either machine nuts or placing pebbles. And it just struck me that these things had gave you two options. 
they're not the vehicle in itself. And so do you actually go on the lathe and do it yourself or do you uh, no no I did them all myself on the lathe at school. Yeah. And just made different sizes from about so, at this eight. point you were working at school you were I was teaching, teaching craft. Yeah, I was teaching craft. You're teaching yeah. crafts and mm-hmm. left things so you actually turned the aluminium bar yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So aluminium, brass, tufnel, whatever. Yeah. And uh, we just tried them. I mean, it in 61, it was obvious that there's going to be a move with the, with the machine nuts already there to use some form of metal device which would go in. And the disadvantage of machine nuts is they stick and they turn and they wedge or they wouldn't seat properly. Uh, they weren't really, they were a first stage. They opened up the idea and then we refined the idea. But the acorn was a different thing insofar as you passed both strands of the sling through and you had a nut on the end as well. It was much more compact, it threaded easier. And in ge- just generally speaking, it, it was an improvement all around. And then when we started climbing, more of the peg roots, which had been done by using wooden wedges, for example, wooden wedge was basically a hand jam with and you couldn't get a mi- uh, an acorn wide enough to go into a hand jam the right width or to something bigger and the more I could an inch and a half you could get in most hand jam cracks at some point or another and they seated well, they were easy to get out, they were bomb proof you felt a lot of confidence and so the acorn right was designed for little finger cracks yeah, it was more for finger in cracks both finger cracks, cracks in, yes. in limestone. Both limestone or gritstone. Yeah. And the when I say we started doing roots on millstone and Rollins Field 3, then obviously they really needed something wider. And the mic was was the answer. And uh, you you could you could literally make yourself bomb proof on cracks, which meant you could actually do the roots that had longer crack sections. And uh, even if you were laid back in, you'd pirouette it off you. What the hell? I mean, you better put run around, but you didn't, uh, didn't. John Brailsford was supporting master craftsmen for other gear designers and manufacturers. These included clog, clog and climbing gear. And he also received a royalty from Mo Antoine's Snowden Mouldings on the Curver Axe for many years. Many individual climbers in the early 1970s who were in urgent need of a new axe with a curved pick willingly paid him four and six, or... 295 in real terms today to have their old one altered and retempered. has of course left a legacy for climbing and for hardware innovation today. We would like to thank John Brailsford for his interview back in 2001 and to a range of people for giving us access to their images. Thank you very much.